Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, it's the 20th anniversary of the shoot, um, and Dead Man's was always a special project for me because it was the lowest budget that I'd, I'd ever had for a feature film and the happiest experience I ever had. And, you know, when you kind of realise um, that, the, you know, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow is actually less money um, and more control. Um, so Dead Man's was a film where I'd had, you know, a couple of films that I kind of made, and, you know, with much bigger budgets that I didn't have creative control. And so Dead Man's was that kind of back to basics um, thing, you know, working on a really short three week shoot all that energy the film was conceived as a film in february 03 and by may 03 we were filming it you know like nowadays it's two three years developing so the whole thing of then coming to edinburgh um and edinburgh is is the most special festival for me because i came with my very first sort of 60 minute film uh, in 1996 came with my mum first ever experience at a film festival first ever interview you know all that so it always had a very special place dead man's as a project was very important for me because it sort of taught me about how to get back to basics and forget all the tricks um, and then to be back at edinburgh just seems so fitting because it was the you know the first time i, I ever sort of saw this side of the world um, you know in 1996 Dead Man's Shoes is obviously made 20 years ago. I don't tend to, because when you make something, you edit it four million times, you have screenings, you end up, it's like a song, you know, you really like a song and then you listen to it too much. Um, so I hadn't seen it since about 2005 and 10 years ago, there was a, the last time I saw it was 10 years ago, there was a screening um, at a, a big old steelworks in Sheffield and they did a live score. So I, I saw it in 2013, I haven't seen it for 10 years. Um, and um, so, you know, so ultimately I'm going to watch it with a, um, an audience tonight and sort of through squinted eyes to, to see how it stands up. Because, um, you know, not everything ages well, does it? But um, but from the amount of, you know, when I don't get recognised a lot, obviously being behind the camera, but when, when I do, it's almost annoying that the first thing that comes out of most people's mouths is Dead Man's Shoes. Obviously this is England, you know, it is a lot of people like this is England, but there's something about Dead Man's Shoes that seems to resonate with people above everything else I've made. Um, and so it'd be really intriguing to see how it stands up 20 years later. I yeah, I mean, it, it's... Because obviously it, it happens so slowly and, and it's it's testament to the film, you know, and obviously, you know, sitting and writing it with Paddy about 20 years ago and doing the first sort of script and just basically not, not kind of knowing really um, whether you could make a film for that kind of amount of money and still kind of hit it. And then it coming out in the cinemas at the exact same time as Saw and Saw going huge and we kind of fell out the cinemas. And so you think it isn't going to have a very long life and hardly anyone's seen it. And then DVDs start to get handed around. And what's really rewarding is the fact that it, it's been passed by word of mouth. People have kind of gone, you know, you need to see this or I think you should see this. And that's probably more special than having a big run in a cinema because people have not let it die. And so it's this thing where um, it's been brought into the, that, you know, consciousness. And obviously it's difficult from this side of the fence to know exactly, you know, to what level. But the fact that um, people have not let it sort of disappear, it's like a, my equivalent as a kid was something like With Nail and I, you know, that you kind of, it's one of those films that someone says, you, you know, get that, whack it on your video player and, you know, you'll love it and you fall in love with it and it's a film that you watch again many times. But so it's 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 really special and I think made more special by the fact that it's been people that haven't let it, you know, fall away into the shadows. Yeah, and Warp have this thing, don't they, which is like they... They do, they're like a 50-50, you know, so they're artists, Every, everything's like shared. It isn't one of them where you sign a long-term deal um, and then you get basically bog all from it. You know, Warp have always been into partnerships, Warp Records this is, and so Warp Films, when it was initially set up, that, that whole idea was working with authors and respect, you know, so working with people that they wanted to work with rather than trying to pay the rent. And so, you know, and, and the, the biggest impact for me was the, the access to music that I'd never heard. You know, Steve Beckett from Warp and Mark in particular were playing me tunes, you know. So in, in a way, say we'd put like a, a classic thriller, revenge sort of score on it, it would have really taken away from the film. But it's so you've got me listening to music for the first time I'd never heard. And so it, it gives it a kind of freshness. Um, and, uh, and as you'd probably know from my stuff, music so integral to kind of how I work that having access to incredible artists I'd never heard and then them also helping us that you know they 
when they did the book, it was completely non-for-profit. It was like lose everyone that was sold lost money because they want the product to be the best it can be. And, and I love that. You know, it's they're much more about, you know, rather than thinking I maybe earned 10 grand off that, I'd look back 20 years and kind of go, I really still want to own that piece. Yeah. And so, yeah, that, that was the first time I'd worked with someone where it felt like they saw it all the way through to the end with this bespoke, tailor-made, handmade sort of care. Um, right down to the people that were distributing it and all of that, you know. So, yeah, they're, they're an incredible company. You know, I, I, th I think there's... I've always loved people in film that are sort of generous, generous with their time and their advice and stuff. And when I first came to Edinburgh, because um, you go to some film festivals, and they're not cold per se, but there's... You know, I remember coming here in 1996, hanging out at the film house and just meeting... You know, whether it be actors, filmmakers, people associated with the festival, locals, there's this real sense of kind of something that seems out of your reach. You know, from a little place called your Toxie, if someone says film festival, I think can. And you know, you, whereas this had all of that glitz and glamour, but actually felt like I was hanging out at the Broadway in Nottingham. There was this lovely sense of people coming together and it's and, and weirdly relationships that get formed. And then you see each other on that circuit. You get to see films. If you're from a place like, you know, I was from, you were lucky to get E.T., let alone some independent cinema. So it's that sort of, you know, as a, for the first time especially, being given a pass that gets you into every film and being able to scour the pages and go and see these films that haven't been released into the world yet, it's really special. But I think more so, it's that sense of um, creatives banging heads together and, uh, and you know, and, and sort of sharing ideas and stuff. It's So many times I've spoken to people at a festival and then a year later or a year and a half later you hear something that they weren't talking about pitching is now filming or has now been made um, you know and, and some of those happy accidents happen at these things you know and would never have happened otherwise.